Uh, hey, my name is Ben Johnson. Um, I'm talking about Raft today. We're talking about distributed consensus. Uh, I wrote a, a library for this protocol back in April called GoRaft, um, and that's kind of what I'm talking about today. Uh, so, you know, whenever I talk about distributed consensus, uh, which isn't like a common topic really to, to bring up, but people always wonder what distributed consensus actually is. Uh, so it's pretty simple when you break it down. Distributed just means you have a bunch of nodes. <clears throat> And then, you know, consensus just means you're coming to an agreement. So you have a single value or like a, a system state that you're trying to come to an agreement on. So, you know, when we talk about this, a lot of times it's used in uh, databases, like master-slave replication. <coughs> um, you can have leader election. So if you have one leader you need to choose out of a group, uh, that's another instance. Uh, and then also distributed locks. So if you're talking about, you know, you have a bunch of nodes that all want to share one resource, uh, you just need to share it one at a time. Uh, you can use uh, this, this type of system for it. <clears throat> so if you're talking about like actual distributed consensus protocols that are used in you know, like popular ones, it's a really short history. Like there's basically one, and it's Paxos <laughs> that everyone talks about. Uh, there's view stamp replication, which is similar to Raft, uh, but it's, uh, it's not widely used. Um, another one's Zab, which is used in Zookeeper, uh, but it's just pretty much used in Zookeeper. <clears throat> so, Paxos was, uh, was written back in, or, you know, made back in the 89 by uh, Leslie Lamport. And uh, oh, so, and, you know, I'll give you the kind of the brief, brief rundown of Paxos. So, you have five different roles within Paxos. You have a client, which is kind of requesting a change to the system. And that goes to the proposer. And the proposer kind of that advocates for the client. And then the proposer then kind of talks to this this group of acceptors. And if you can get a quorum or like a, a majority of them you can connect with, then it comes back and says, okay, I'm ready for all that. And the proposer goes and sends the change over. Once it's accepted, it's kind of a learned value. That's the new value of the system. And it goes into all these learners. And now the proposer becomes the leader. And that's kind of in a nutshell what Paxos is. So if this seems kind of confusing to you, um, I share the same uh, you know, understanding of it, it's, it's kind of confusing, it's kind of opaque, there's a lot of roles. Um, sometimes they get collapsed down to, uh, you know, different roles are shared in different versions of Paxos, but that's the basic idea. And then every time you have a new change, we need to go through this whole, whole dance. If you guys have any questions, just raise a hand or shout out. Okay, so now that we're talking about Paxos, you know, this isn't about Paxos, let's get into uh, actual raft. Uh, details. So it's created by this uh, hipster looking guy right here, uh, Diego Angaro. He's a PhD student over at Stanford. Uh, and then also this less hipster looking guy, uh, John Osterhout, who's a professor over there. Uh, and it came out in uh, about April, April, May of this year. Uh, so the reference implementation is called Log Cabin. It's used in this project called Ramcloud. And this is why I love the internet. Like, you can search for raft log cabin, and there's actually an image result. <laughs> uh, so, and it got really popular really fast. Uh, I don't know if it was just the right time for this kind of library, but, or this kind of protocol. There's actually 28 implementations across different languages. There's like eight Go implementations. Um, I know there's, um, there's one from F, in F Sharp, this guy here, uh, Hendrik is over there. Uh, two of the guys from Braintree also did Go ones. Uh, ben Mills, I forget the other guy, but um, I'm just curious, does anybody else have a Raft implementation <laughs> in this room? Okay, so if you guys have questions, go and uh, talk to those guys as well afterward. It, yeah, it just got, a, got to be really uh, popular. Uh, it's also in commercial use, so it's not just theoretical at this point. Uh, there's a company called Core OS, it's a Y Combinator company. They actually made a, a tool called etcd to kind of share configuration across all your, your nodes in your cluster, uh, and it's backed by GoRaft. And they did a lot of work to help out with that library as well, uh, and they also did the, the cool little design there with the, the gopher and the raft. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> we're actually talking about raft itself. Uh, so Paxos it was actually based on this theoretical, like uh, this Greek island that has this parliamentary system and how people vote and how that knowledge kind of gets transferred out. So there's also kind of a, when I think about Raft, I think of uh, an, a democratically elected dictatorship. So that's kind of the, the sense of government you can kind of think about. So you have three different roles in Raft. 
at the leader, which uh, this is a little aside. If you're ever looking up democratically elected dictatorships, you get basically like Mussolini and Hitler. And you don't want to put Hitler on a, a slide up there. So <laughs> that is Mussolini. Uh, you have the follower right here, and they just they take whatever you know the leader tells them and just keeps doing it. And then you have the candidate. So if the followers don't actually have a, a leader to go off of, they don't hear from him, they, you know, they can become candidates and then eventually leaders themselves. Okay, so this is gonna be the quick rundown before we get into details, but this is just the high level, high level overview. So let's say we have three nodes on our cluster. They all start as, uh, as followers here. So if, if they don't hear anything from a leader, one of them's gonna flip over into a, a candidate. And this starts what's called an election. So this, uh, this candidate right here is gonna start asking for votes. So you know, ask for votes from the followers. You know, they, they haven't voted for anybody, so they'll come back and say okay. So now it has enough votes to then become the leader. So at this point, start sending kind of these commands for how to change the state of the system from the leader down to the follower so that they, they all can have the same state. They just keep uh, replicating these kind of uh, iterative commands through log entries. Uh, and if there's no actual changes to the state, uh, the leader just kind of keeps its oppressive reign by uh, just sending these heartbeats and basically saying to the, the followers, you know, I'm still here, I'm still here, don't try to elect a new leader. Okay, so in the case that a leader dies or the, the, the network goes down or whatnot, you know, the, the followers will just not hear anything for a little bit. So one's going to change into a, a candidate, he'll ask for a vote, and in this three node cluster, uh, you just need a majority to win the actual leader uh, leadership. So it has two votes, one for itself, one from the follower, uh, and then it becomes a leader. So now it will start sending down these log entries and heartbeats, and uh, this process just keeps going over and over again as uh, nodes die and come back. Uh, you'll also notice, too, you always need a majority of nodes running to actually make your cluster uh, live and actually work. So if you have three nodes and two go down, you're down. If you have five nodes, two go down, or three go down, then you're down. So that's, that's one uh, trade-off with uh, these kind of quorum-based or majority-based uh, systems. Uh, so let's, there's really two pieces to raft. So you have leader election on one side, you know, how do you actually figure out who's gonna make changes to the system, and then you have lo uh, log replication. That's the other kind of the, the other half. So yeah, in this leader election, we're gonna, you know, let's kind of step-by-step look through how this works out. Uh, and at the bottom, you can kind of see a timeline. The whole thing is one second, or we're just gonna use kind of a fraction of that. And then on the top here, we have three nodes. <clears throat> uh, and the one's on there, so the F means follower. The one is the term, the current election term. So these terms, they just, they keep going, and the leader will just stay in a term for as long as it can. And if it kind of, uh, if it gets deposed, or you know, if it dies or whatnot, a new one will be, be, uh, be elected in a new term. So they're all in term one right now, okay? So they're all the way around for the election timeout. So basically, the length of time that it takes, you know, if they haven't heard anything from a leader, um, and it's, it's randomized, it's between 150 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds, and then one of them is gonna flip over, hopefully just one of them, you can't get more, but in this case, we're just talking about the happy path. Uh, one's gonna flip over to a candidate, and it's gonna increment its uh, election term to term two. So it's gonna start requesting votes, and uh, let's say in this instance it hits one of them, but for some reason the, the request down to the bottom one doesn't work out. Uh, you know, the first one's gonna grant, so now it has two votes, one from itself, one from a follower, and it becomes leader of term two, and starts kind of blasting out saying, I'm the leader, and then everybody that hears that will start following. And that, then everyone actually, anytime you actually see a term, uh, or, and like a node sees a term, a new term, a higher term, it'll just move up to that term. So if you're sending log entries or uh, vote requests or whatnot, it'll always use the, the last term it saw. Oh, also, if you're looking at the, at the bottom, it really doesn't take long. Once that timeout goes, it only takes, you know, depending on your network. I mean, this stuff goes pretty fast to kind of resolve who the leader is. Uh, okay, so that was leader election. Any questions so far? Uh, so that's leader election, kind of best case scenario. One candidate flips over and you're good. Uh, another thing that can happen is you can actually get a split vote where you have two candidates that come up at the same time. They both start grabbing votes and then neither one gets a majority. Uh, so in this case, you know, we'll wait for the timeout. They both flip over and now we have two candidates in term two trying to get votes. 
So let's say they first go and get these first two uh, followers. They get votes from them because they haven't voted for anyone yet. Uh, next, they'll kind of cross over and try to get the other ones. But these guys have already voted in term two, so they can't vote again. So it's going to get denied. They try to get votes from each other. That doesn't work out either. And then we're in this kind of stalemate where you know, no more votes can be had. They each have two votes. And that's not a majority yet. You need three votes in this four, uh, four cluster system, or four node system. So we're going to keep waiting. And then eventually, it's going to change over to the next, uh, next term. So now the election term is term three. And in this term, it's going to start getting votes from that first candidate. So hopefully, that one flips over before the next one with the, the randomized timeout. Uh, so it's going to grab votes. Uh, it can get votes from both of them in term three, because they haven't voted in term three. And now it's the leader, because it has three votes. Uh, this one might then not recognize that that one's a leader yet, um, and then try to get votes, uh, and it'll get denied at that point. And once the leader actually starts shooting out saying, hey, uh, I'm leader of term three, that other candidate is going to uh, step down. And then at this point, you kind of have a stable system where we have a leader and a whole bunch of followers. That's kind of what we want. OK? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's set at about 150 milliseconds to 300 is the range. You can adjust that if you want to, if you definitely have like a, a much longer latency. Uh, but that's the idea. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Go ahead. Back there. Um, they're all related in the sense that they, they more or less act independently unless they hear from a leader. In which case, they just kind of, um, you know, they'll just keep following whatever leader they have until there is that timeout if they don't hear anything from anyone. And at that point, they'll um, kind of become a, a candidate and then hopefully a leader. So they're, they're fairly isolated and independent until they need to kind of step up. Any other questions? Oh, so oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, you won't have a term four until one of these followers gets cut off, and then it needs to kind of elect, its, elect itself as a leader. At that point, it will. Uh, that is a really good question. There's, there's a, a slide I will show on that. But it'll basically it'll start incrementing that, um, that candidate on the, on the split. Um, but if you have a split, you can only have either it's going to be split, you know, say, right down the middle. And you have two, and neither one's going to have a majority of the nodes. So neither one's going to be functional. Um, they'll just kind of keep increasing their terms until they connect back together. And then one will um, become a leader. Um, or the other case is where you just get one cut off from the other three. And those other three are, can have a majority between them. And they'll keep functioning. But that one that's isolated is just going to be down. Go ahead. How does it know when to switch <coughs> to the next term, or how does that work? So the, the terms is going to be whenever the, the follower doesn't hear from a leader, it's going to automatically flip over to become a candidate after a certain time uh, timeout, and then it just increments by one. Does that mean the clocks all have to be in sync, or does it really matter? No, there's no clocks to worry about in this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do, how do they know about each other? Is it just broadcasting on the local subnet, or do you have to tell them these are all the machines involved in your graph? Uh, you have to tell them what the cluster configuration is. Uh, you'll have to know explicitly how to get to them and the you know, IP address or whatnot, um, as well as um, you'll have to know the total count so you can calculate the quorum size or the, the majority. Any other? Oh, yeah. If a subnet node gets isolated, so their idea is the term number is not increasing, and in the meantime, the majority of the nodes have been increasing the term number, and then the other one will be joined. They don't need to know the correct term number. No, what will actually happen is that it'll try to elect um, itself, and then there's actually a, a replicated log that we're going to get to in a second. So that log is going to basically have kind of the current state and all the commands to get to that state. Um, so if it realizes it doesn't have the current log, it's going to try to become a candidate. Um, it'll see that it doesn't have the current log and step down, although its turn number uh, will now be visible to the leader, and the leader will actually update its turn to be higher than that that candidate was trying to be. Does that make sense? Or re-elect a new candidate? I think so. Okay, yeah. It may, it may become more advanced by Okay, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Well, so if a node, if a 
node receives a message from a leader from, from another node saying, I am a leader, does it unquestionably accept that that node is a leader? Uh, only if it's at a higher term. So if it's a lower term, the lower one will um, be deposed, will step down to a follower. So whichever one has a higher term, basically. If it got a message for the same term for two different nodes, both claiming to be the leader, would it freak out? Then you're broken. Yeah, they won't work. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, under the rules of the system, that shouldn't occur, but because you can only get a, uh, you can only become leader if you get a majority of votes for the term. We're trying to guarantee that that can never happen. What's that? We're trying to guarantee that that can never happen. Yeah, I mean, and under the, you can only vote once per term, and you can only become a leader for a given term if you get a majority of votes. And since you can only get a majority one time within the cluster, uh, it should ensure that you only get one, uh, one leader per term. Uh, I mean, you can, yeah, under the system, you, you don't have um, like the Byzantine problem where you actually have, you know, corrupted messages or things like that. You're assuming that everyone's kind of working together for the common goal. There's no, like, uh, nefarious nodes out there. Any, any other questions? Yeah. So, so that's leader election. That's kind of the best, or good case scenario, bad case scenario, but it all resolves to a single leader. It's kind of what you want. So the other half is log replication. Uh, in this case, so we have three nodes here. We have a leader. Sorry, I wave my hands a lot. And that actually doesn't have anything to do with what's going on on, the, on there sometimes. So just ignore me. Uh, so what happens is that you know, we'll have a leader already elected, we'll assume. And then we have these two followers. So the state of the system is actually replicated by this log. Um, and each one has their own individual log. <clears throat> so what's going to happen, you know, we'll, there's a, oh, also there's a heartbeat that occurs in here. So uh, that, that leader is going to keep sending out these messages, either passing along new entries in this log to the, the followers, or it'll basically tell them that, hey, I don't have any more entries, but I'm, I'm still here. So a new kind of uh, entry in here. Oh, also we're also tracking this as basically just single string values on each node. So this is the most simple database you can think of, uh, but it's, each one's going to have its own string. They're all initialized to blank strings right now. So the, the first entry in here in this log is going to be Sally. So Sally comes in, it's written to the log, but that value doesn't show anywhere yet, you know, outside of this, this log. Um, it just lives on the leader right now. What's gonna happen is that it's gonna send this RPC called append entries out to the, the followers, and then the followers will actually write that to their log, and then come back and confirm. So say this, this one follower comes back first, and says, okay, I already have this written. As long as it's written on a majority of nodes, then, um, then the, that entry can be committed on the, the leader itself. So now it's committed on the leader, and the leader sees this as Sally at that point, and then it'll, you know, we can get that uh, other confirmation back from the other node, although at this point it's already uh, committed at the top in the, in the leader, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, and at this point, when it sends out the next heartbeat, it'll basically say, I don't have any more entries for you, but that other entry that I sent you, it's committed now, so you guys go ahead and commit it. So at this point, everything is committed. Okay, so we're, we're all Sally. Okay, and then you know uh, we can get another heartbeat. There's no new information, so it just kind of keeps sending out that heartbeat. And at this point, you know, just before the next heartbeat, we get a an entry called Bob. So now we want to change the system from Sally to Bob. Uh, so it's going to send out these append entries. Everyone's going to get Bob. Going to come back and confirm it's committed now. And the next heartbeat, it's going to commit to everywhere. So now everybody's Bob. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's the best case scenario with everything, you know, all the nodes are up, network's up, you're doing great. So most of the time, this is how it should really work. It's just, you're sending out these, um, these entries, it's kind of a two-phase commit sort of a protocol. So now we're gonna talk about network partitions. Um, I don't know, Kyle's having to talk about this, Kyle Kingsbury, uh, in the big room uh, after lunch. Uh, you should check it out if you are interested in this stuff. But in the case of network partitions, you really want to make sure that you don't have this idea of a split brain, where you have two leaders that can both commit and change this log and the state of the system at the same time. Because once that uh, partition comes back up or you know, resolves itself, then all these nodes are going to try to talk to each other, and you have to resolve what those conflicts are, and you don't want that. Uh, there are, you can do stuff with vector clocks. If you want to talk to the Basho guys, Tom Santero's over there. 
I'm sorry, yeah, there's all kinds of bashful people. They'll tell you about Dr. Clocks. Um, so, you know, we'll do the same thing. We'll put Sally in here, sends out, comes back and commits it. You know, sends out the heartbeat so everyone's committed. We're all Sally, okay? Now we get this, the dreaded network partition in here. So some of the nodes are cut off. It's not like they're down, but they're just cut off. So now we have these two separate clusters, essentially, that, you know, it's one cluster, but it's separated, these little subclusters. So now what we want to do, you know, it's still sending out the heartbeats on the top from the leader. It still thinks it's le the leader. It's going to keep trying to be the leader. Uh, we put in a new value of Bob. It gets replicated over to the, the follower, comes back and confirms. But at this point, we don't actually have a majority. So they can't be committed. We're still waiting for at least one other node in our five node cluster uh, to actually make this a committed value. So it's just going to hang out. And we're kind of in this limbo state at this point. So after the timeout occurs down at the bottom, you know, one of these nodes is going to flip over to be a, a uh, candidate and uh, term two. So, you know, let's try to get some votes. There's three nodes down there, so it can actually grab all the votes and become a leader. And at this point, we have two leaders, which sounds like a really bad thing, but we're isolated on top in that we can't commit values because we don't have a majority. So now our functioning cluster is really on the bottom here with uh, the leader two in the, in the second term. So we're going to put in a, a new value of Tom on the bottom. You know, send that out to all, you know, all our nodes. They're going to come back. We have a majority at the bottom, so we can commit that, and it'll push those out down to the, uh, the followers. So the functioning cluster at the bottom has the new value of Tom. Um, and then we still have this uncommitted entry of Bob on the top. Once the partition goes away, uh, it's going to send out that heartbeat. And then what's going to happen first is that the top candidate over there, or the, the leader, is going to see that there's a new term, a new leader and a new term. So it's going to step down and become a follower of, uh, of term two. That other follower in term one is going to flip over to term two. And the next step we have after that is that it's going to roll back any uncommitted entries uh, so that you know, the world's never seen outside of that log of the Bob entry. So everything's been Sally the whole time. So it's going to roll back that, roll back that Bob entry and then replicate any entries that the, the new leader has. So it's Tom. So now everybody's Tom. OK? OK, I've got some questions. Uh, Rich? So uh, you're just showing these values uh, appearing in the leader, like the way the leader has Sally, but the presumption is still clients. They yeah. communicate that to the leader. Yeah. How do they ever find out about uh, the new leader? About the new leader? How would the new leader ever get Tom from a client? How would the new leader ever get Tom from a client? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you have to, you'll have to persist the actual current leader within each of the, the follower nodes, or have some system of keeping track of who the... So clients need to know the uh, overall membership as well? Um, you can store it inside the, the servers and, or the, the nodes themselves to pass it along and forward it if you wanted to, but that's not necessarily part of the protocol. In the partition, how do you get up? Like, how would you switch over? How would you switch over from the... Uh, you have, I mean, there are some different options. You can have it just stall on the, the top ones if you wanted to. It's kind of where it is right now. I mean, you can have that, um, the leader one timeout eventually if it can't connect to a quorum. Uh, there are some options, but it's not specified in the protocol itself. Um, but that actual, as far as passing along to figure out going from a follower to a leader, um, you can specify that, you know, in the, you can keep that state in the nodes themselves. Um, and then pass along messages or just notify the client this is the new leader, and they go and redirect their message there. Uh, it's not specified in the protocol itself, but there's different options. Is that what you're asking, Rich? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So, suppose you have um, a partition, and one of the nodes, say the, the one on the bottom right, the uh, one on the bottom left, right, decides that it's a candidate, but then the partition immediately goes away. If you have a leader and a candidate, uh, if you have a leader and a candidate, the the leader will step down on the top because it sees that there's a higher election term that's been started. Um, although if it has a, a set of log entries that are, um, if it's more up to date in its log entries than the other candidates, then it'll eventually become the candidate and then leader itself again. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay, so I mean, if you had, uh, let's go back to Bob and Sally here. Uh, okay, in this sense, or yeah, so in this situation here, if we cut out the partition, um, 
you know, the, the top two nodes will, the leader at the top, leader one, is gonna see that there's a new term, so it's gonna actually step down. But when these candidates at the bottom then try to become, actually, let's go back one more. Here, okay. So it'll see that there's a term two um, on the top, and it'll step down. But this candidate down here, one other rule is that you can't become candidate if there are other um, nodes with high, like a, a more complete log. So basically, the entries in the log are further. You know about the log, What's that? If you know about the log, the well, that's true, but you can't actually. Oh, okay. So you can't commit unless you have a majority, and you can't get enough votes to become a leader if you have a, unless you have a majority. So assuming that. Um, something, so assuming the Sally down here is going to become a leader, it has to have a majority, and at least one of those nodes will have the most complete log because that most complete log has to be in a majority of nodes. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, it's, it's, there's a nuance there, definitely. It's kind of confusing. Um, yeah, uh, okay. So it seems like the hardest thing about this is deciding how many nodes are in the cluster. Uh, does that mean that if you, like, is Raft a good protocol Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a protocol for actually adding nodes. There's some complexity there. Uh, I didn't really want to get into it this talk because it's kind of a whole talk itself, where you actually can have these kind of uh, different sets of membership. We could you know, be swapping out two nodes for two other nodes, in which case you can actually have two disjoint majorities, and then you actually have to combine the two, um, two sets of uh, memberships to get a, a full uh, like a majority. So it's confusing, but yes, there is a way to... Uh, switch over the cluster membership. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Say you have a asymmetric network partition that there's one node which can no <coughs> longer receive any messages, but it can still send messages. Uh, okay. Now, if we think, if there's the follower node, it would think that the leader has gone because it's no longer receiving messages. So it becomes a candidate with a new, uh, a new term number, uh, but it can still send it. Oh, that's what you're saying. Um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you can't, it does really rely on that request response, the full thing. So if, if you have it asymmetrical, um, it's, I mean, it, it'll essentially be a, you know, a partition at that point. I mean, even if it is asymmetrical, I mean, you'll probably get a, a candidate that tries to become the new leader who may not be able to become the new leader, depending on the, you know, how it's split as far as if there's a majority, it can access both ways. You basically need bi-directional communication to be able to become uh, a candidate and leader, or become a leader. So you can get that split. It, it works the same way, I would believe, as a, uh, a synchronous partition, I assume. Uh, back then. Oh, yeah, I will do. Sorry about that. He asked if a, an asynchronous network partition would cause a different issue or would cause a problem of a, a leader trying to communicate down to followers, but those followers can't respond or vice versa. And then those become candidates and they can send out votes but can't receive them. There's just some complexity around uh, asynchronous um, partitions. Uh, yep. Also, what if there's multiple partitions and as a result, no, no node can get a majority of votes? Uh, then you're screwed. You're down. <laughs> I mean, it essentially, you, you still need the majority. That's kind of the, the issue. That's uh, one liability you have with the doing this kind of system, although you ensure that you only have one actual value, um, kind of one true like leader and value at a given time. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the client will get a notification. I mean, it really depends on how your library is implemented. In GoRaft, um, clients will connect and they'll hold that connection until that, uh, the, the command that they want to, whatever they want to do is completed and committed and then they get a response back. If it gets rolled back for some reason, then they'll get a response saying that it, it was an error. So it, when it actually tries to read the system, you'll never read Bob from the system. Um, you'll try to write it, but it can, it can block the write if it rolls back. Uh, go ahead. So what if um, like the leader commits Bob and then the leader becomes partitioned from the network so they can't send the sort of final commit message to all the followers and then they elect a new leader? 
So, yeah, so, okay, so, sorry, I'm not repeating the questions back there. So he's asking what happens if um, the leader up here commits Bob, and then, let's go back a little bit. Uh, let's see here. So let's say the leader actually goes out and comes back. Uh, if it actually could commit Bob, it would have a majority, and you'd have Bob on the majority of nodes. So even though it's committed on, um, on that leader right there, and then it gets split off in the rest of the partition, um, those other nodes are sc still gonna have the most up-to-date um, log. So that when they try to you know, form a, uh, when they try to determine a candidate and a new leader, they're gonna pick the person with the, the most recent log. Does that make sense? So you're always ensured that you have that in there. So uh, Yeah, exactly. So it's not committed to everyone else, but it's uh, it will be at some point. Uh, which, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, does that make sense? Oh, go ahead. I was confused by a race condition. Okay. Suppose, say, that um, the middle node on the right um, confirms that the committed bomb, so the top left node has committed bomb, but right middle node doesn't know that it's um, okay message was received. And then these three nodes at the bottom elect um, a leader. What happens? So, when the, th so the question is, uh, it's similar. The follower in the middle, I'll just walk over. This is easier. So if Bob is replicated over to this one and this one, and they come back and confirm uh, to the leader that it's, you know, it's committed, and these three up here, uh, leader, follower, follower, all have Bob, but follower over here in the middle doesn't actually realize that it's committed yet, it's still uncommitted, uh, and then this cluster down here, this little subcluster, tries to elect a new leader. Uh, to answer your question, uh, that node right there is always gonna have the most up-to-date in this little subcluster, so it'll become the new leader. It'll become the candidate and then lead, new leader to guarantee, and that's why you kind of have these majorities on the, uh, the log replication and on the, um, uh, the voting as well, because you're always ensure that that update log is at least in that subcluster that can go into uh, a new leader. I missed that. Yeah, it, yeah, it's some subtlety. Um, in the orange? Uh, maybe this is a fundamental assumption I'm not getting, but uh, you could only commit, a client could only commit data to a leader. But yes. Um, it really depends if you want to support phantom reads or not. Um, if you, yeah, I mean, you, you definitely have some danger if you want to read from the, the clients themselves. Um, ultimately, you know, you'll probably get, yeah, I mean, it could be dangerous if you want to do that. But yeah, you should read and write through the leader itself if you want to ensure one value at a time. So you have replication, uh, but you still, your throughput can be limited in that sense. Uh, yeah. So, so Bob is actually uncommitted, so the value, it's a little subtle, under the leader is actually Sally until that's committed. So you always read Sally, Bob is never actually a real committed value. Any other questions? So his question, sorry, I'm gonna not repeat. Uh, he was saying that Bob up here could be read from the leader, but it's, uh, it's not yet committed. So the leader at one up there will always be Sally until it reconnects down to this new uh, leader of the cluster later. Go one more. If you have two more that crash on there, oh, if you had an additional two on this cluster, um, then the total size would be seven, and your majority would be, uh, was it four? Uh, if they don't recover, then you're gonna have to remove them from the cluster membership. Okay, I'm gonna. There's just a couple more left, uh, and then we can do some more questions here. Okay, so actually, what? Let's just go till. So I have a schedule. Is it 11:20? The end? Yeah. Okay, I got three minutes. <laughs> so, really, really quick. Log compaction, uh, you have an issue where you have this log and it's just unbounded. So obviously you're gonna run out of disk space. Uh, at some point, even on your, your SAN you got out there, 
it's eventually going to fill up. Although the bigger issue that you actually have is that your recovery time is going to increase. So as you add more log entries, if a node goes down and has to come back up and replay all those entries of all your, your insets to your database, your updates, your deletes, your drop your customer table, whole thing, it's going to have to do all that stuff over again, and it's going to take a while to recover. So you don't want your, your nodes to recover after an hour. Uh, so there's actually three st strategies mentioned in the in like a supplemental paper. Uh, you have one where it's leader initiated and stored in the actual log that gets replicated out. So what happens is you kind of have the snapshot that gets sliced up and little chunks get uh, embedded within the, the log that goes out. And there's a start point, a start marker, and an end marker. So as it goes out, the, those follower nodes will collect the snapshot, rebuild it, and then replay all the entries since the start marker. Um, another one is it's stored, uh, oh, it's initiated by the actual RAF library, uh, but it's just a whole block of snapshot that just gets sent out, and then the rest of the entries come after that. And then the one that's actually implemented in GoRaft is the actual application kind of initiates when it should snapshot, and it works the same way. The snapshot goes out, and then entries follow after that. Okay, so that was really quick, but hopefully that makes some sense. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm Ben B. Johnson on Twitter. I'm also Ben B. Johnson on GitHub and pretty much everywhere else on the web. And then Ben at SkylineLabs.com if you have longer questions than 140 characters. Right there? Oh, bye.